Welcome to X for the Unknown. I'm Tim, and today I'm at the Lakeside Cemetery, and we're going to hopefully get some answers to a unsolved 50-year-old double homicide. We're going to go into the history of what happened, and then right after, we'll start our investigation. Stick around to the end, and I've got a oh, I've got a story that uh, it was really stupid many, and something definitely you don't want to do. On Friday, October 15th, 1971, at approximately 7 a.m., the Fremont and Indiana Police Department received a call from an employee of the First National Bank. The caller, Wayne Siddell, reported that upon arriving at the bank, he and his colleagues discovered a peculiar note on a typewriter at one of their workstations. The note read, in part, There is a bomb in the vault. My husband is being held hostage. This is not a joke. It was signed by bank employee, 50-year-old Esther Ferguson. After explaining that their attempts to contact Esther had failed, Officers were promptly dispatched to the Ferguson residence, situated a mere mile from First National. There, police discovered Esther and her husband, 55-year-old Everett Ferguson, deceased in the home's basement. Everett's body was discovered seated in a chair in the basement. His hands and feet were bound with sash cord and his mouth secured shut with adhesive tape. A single shotgun wound to the back of the head had ended his life. Esther's body was found lying on the floor next to Everett. Like her husband, she had been bound, gagged, and shot once in the head. Prominent figures in the community. Everett Ferguson, a WW2 veteran, was the longtime manager of the local hardware store, located just two doors down from the bank. He also served as the town's treasurer. Esther Ferguson had a long and distinguished career at First National Bank, beginning as a teller at the age of 19. Her dedication and hard work were recognized in 1961 when she was honored as Outstanding Woman of the Year by the county's Professional Women's Club. In addition to their professional pursuits, both Esther and her husband were actively involved in numerous community organizations and were deeply devout members of their church. The Ferguson's modest home sat perched along Fremont's primary east-west artery through town, Highway 120 slash Toledo Street. They had only recently purchased the house just two months prior. An initial search of the residence revealed no apparent valuables missing. Detectives did discover, however, that the couple's gold 1971 Oldsmobile was gone. In its place sat a car that was not registered to either of the Fergusons. The vehicle was later determined to be stolen. Their missing Oldsmobile was recovered the following day, approximately seven miles away, hidden in the weeds alongside an unused barn. At First National Bank, no bomb was found, but it was confirmed that a robbery had occurred. A count of the bank's vault revealed a substantial loss of funds, estimated to be between $25,000 and $40,000. Sources vary on the exact amount. Employees at the bank informed investigators that Esther's shift had proceeded normally the previous day. After handling several calls, she left at 4.30 p.m., they added that as she exited, Esther mentioned she had activated the time lock mechanism on the inner vault. The bank's vault consisted of two layers. The first, the outer vault, was secured with a key and a combination known to only a select few employees. Although a significant sum of money was stored there for daily operations, the majority of funds were kept in the inner vault. The second layer was equipped with a time lock mechanism that once activated, prevented access until the following morning at a designated time. Investigators theorized that at least two men were responsible for the robbery. They believed that the robbers had called Esther during her shift, having already infiltrated her home, and were holding Everett hostage at the time of the call. 
they assumed that the robbers had threatened to harm Everett if Esther did not refrain from activating the time lock on the inner vault, and she had obeyed their demands. After the bank closed, one thief returned with Esther, forcing her to open the vault and type the letter, while the other stayed with Everett. After stealing the money, they returned to the Ferguson residence. To support this theory, detectives interviewed several neighbors who provided crucial details about the timeline of events. Dennis Fulton, a 21-year-old member of the Fremont Volunteer Fire Department, told investigators he had passed by the Ferguson residence at 4 p.m. Everett, a former member of the fire department himself, always acknowledged passing firefighters with a wave from his usual spot, a blue recliner near the living room window. However, after honking the fire engine's horn, Dennis noticed that the shades were drawn and there was no sign of Everett at the window. A second neighbor informed investigators that she had visited the Fergusons at 7 p.m. to check on Everett, who had recently suffered a near-fatal heart attack. She stated that when she knocked on their front door, someone inside turned off all the lights, but no one answered. Assuming that Everett and Esther were simply trying to rest, she returned home. Another neighbor, 26-year-old Bruce Stonstreet, informed police that at 2 a.m. he had stepped outside for a cigarette after tending to his infant daughter. He noted that the couple's car was still parked in the driveway at that time. However, when he left for work at 5 a.m., the vehicle was gone. Those interviewed spoke highly of the Fergusons, describing them as integral members of the Fremont community. No one could identify a potential suspect or motive for harming the couple aside from the obvious to prevent identification of the robbers. Esther and Everett were laid to rest in Fremont's Lakeside Cemetery. Unfortunately, despite extensive investigations by multiple state, local, and federal agencies, including an offer of a $14,000 reward, no arrests were ever made, and the case remains unsolved. All right, we are here at the Ferguson gravesite. Uh, we're going to try some call and response to hopefully get some names. Uh, All right. We're at the Ferguson's tombstone. I have this. If you want to show yourself, you can get in front of this camera right here in my right hand and I can see you. If you uh, want to talk to me, you can choose words out of this library, this little uh, thing I have in my left hand and you can talk to me. You can give me words to tell me um, who you are, how you died, or you can talk to me about anything. I'm just gonna walk around and you just let me know if you're here. Can you, anybody, anybody here know the Fergusons? How many of you, how many of you are with me tonight? Turn, do you want me to turn? There's something behind Lisa. I don't see you. Here. You're 25? What's your first name? Am I close to your grave site? Scratch. Scratch? Are you going to scratch me? Don't scratch. Oh, upstairs. Are you at my house? Themselves. themselves? They didn't kill themselves. Earlier, before I turned the, uh, the camera on, it actually said basement where yep. the Fergusons were murdered. Mm -hmm. Yep. This one said slave okay. and government. What would you like returned? You said return.
Okay, if the Fergusons are here, can you show yourself to me or you can use this EMF reader, get really close and make it go up to yellow, orange or red for a few seconds and I'll know you're here. And then I have uh, this in my left hand. It's like a library. You can choose words so you can talk to me. Earlier you said company. So are you keeping me company? Did you know the Fergusons? Or are you the Fergusons? Ninety. Are you ninety years old? Who am I talking to? What's your name? Can you give me your name? Angle? Your name's not Angle. What's your name? Did you die in August? Did you know the Fergusons? How did you die? All right, we're going to try to contact Everett and Esther Ferguson using a digital tape recorder, uh, which would uh, be an EVP session. I'm going to ask some simple questions and hopefully we'll get some responses. Uh, Everett and Esther, we are friends. We would like to just ask you some questions and put your words on this digital recorder. And hopefully we can get some names who might have uh, murdered you. All right. Are you here, Everett and Esther? If you're here, we would love to talk to you. Could you give us some names? We know there were two people who did this to you. Did you know them? Were these two close to you? Okay, I'm going to stop right there. We'll uh, play it back. All right. Are you here, Everett and Esther? If you're here, we would love to talk to you. Could you give us some names? We know there were two people who did this to you. Did you know them? Did you stop it? Okay. You, you didn't finish your question. Were these two close to you? I'm going to stop right there. All right. We are going to use the spirit box now and see if we get anything with that. Okay. Now we're going to use the spirit box to try to talk to the Fergusons to get some answers. So, Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson, you just choose words from all the stations on this device and you'll be able to talk to us. We're gonna start it right now. What was this? I heard what was this. Yeah. Company? I heard couple. Couple? What do you say? All right, company, what's this? They were what? If you come up here, use the words, pick a station, use words. Yeah. 
at study night? No. You said no? Yeah. No? I'm not supposed to hear the radio talk just to say the song. Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson, are you here? Say, say yes. I heard yes. I want to turn the antenna off. There you go. This uh, particular model, this is a Pro, uh, SB7 Pro. You can actually turn the antenna off, which is really nice. We asked Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson if they're here with us, and we got a yes through this device. Do you know who murdered you? Take any words to any station. Flip through it until you find the words. Do you know who murdered you? Your time's out. Can you, do you know their names? Do you know who murdered you? I know, you know, who murdered you? Can you give me a name or names? Evan. Evan? Were there two of them? Did two people murder you? How did you die? Were you shot? Were you shot? Were uh, the people who murdered you family? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Were they uh, cousins? No. Were they aunts, uncles? Yes. Yeah. Mm hmm So do you, was it two uncles? An uncle and a friend? Yes. Hey. We're getting some. What are their names? Can you give us the names? T T Terry? 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 What is the, what is the, your uncle's name? We want to help you get justice. Jen? Or Jen? That'd be an aunt. Yeah, we don't know if there are two males. Was the person who murdered you, did he take over the bank after you were gone? Did his last name begin with M? I'm going to switch to AM. Oh, I would have been AM. The person who murdered you, did his last name begin with an M? Were the people related to you that murdered you? Do you know who murdered you? Yes. Did you get a yes? Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to be using two devices here uh, to try to get some sort of response. Uh, the first one is a REM pod. You get your hand next to it. And then we have our, our Poulter script or PS device. It's like an obelisk. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson, you, if you're here, you are welcome to
come up close to that. You can let me know that you're here. We still really would love to get some names. And you can also use this device. You can, uh, you can use it to make words and use it to give us names. It's interesting that a, a young lawyer in the area has actually approached the state police and is trying to get the case reopened. Back in the day when this happened, they said that they had uh, some suspects, but there was not enough evidence to, uh, to actually prosecute them or arrest them. Uh, Our? Scientists. Scientists. Happen. Happen. Eight years. Eight years. Yeah, none of this makes much sense. Unless eight years ago the uh, the murders uh, fled to Arkansas. Release. I would love some names. Last names, first names, anything. All right, we didn't get a lot. Uh, we did get some yes answers. Uh, they seem like they, they did know who murdered them. We really wanted to get some names. We're gonna keep trying uh, some more. Uh, but on a, uh, a side note, my parents knew the uh, Fergusons very well. In fact, my, my mother was in the bank, actually the day that, that uh, the homicides happened, and, uh, and she, was, uh, she was waited on by Esther. Wayne Seidel, uh, the bank manager, and uh, his son, and wife knew the Fergusons very well. In fact, they would stop up at their uh, their home. The Fergusons would leave their porch light on to let them know that it was okay just to come on in. And in a, well, in a crazy turn of events, that night the porch light was off and they just kept going. And the time that they were there, was the exact same time that they were murdered. Uh, it's pretty crazy. All right. Now, the crazy story that I have is back in the mid 80s, um, I was, uh, oh, I was still in high school. My friend and I, we used to come out to the cemetery quite a bit. And back then, this is before I was a paranormal investigator. We were just ghost hunters. We came out in the, the cemetery here, ran around. Uh, we never heard anything. We were very respectful. We weren't, weren't those type of kids that would, uh, that would break things and, uh, and ruin grave sites. But anyways, um, we came out here just, just we just want to be scared. You know, we, we, wanted, to would, be uh, we wanted to be terrified. Well, we, uh, we had the bright idea, probably after a few beers, of coming out here. Um, we were out here early in the evening, probably back in 85 or 86, and we saw a, uh, an open grave, uh, just an open hole before anyone was interned in it. And again, I'm sure there was a few beers involved, but we decided to come back that night at midnight and we had a Ouija board <laughs> and I don't ever do this. It was the dumbest thing I probably have ever done, but we both jumped down that hole at midnight with a Ouija board. And this was actually Halloween night. And we weren't sure. I mean, our eyes were huge, and we weren't sure if the devil himself was going to jump out of that board. Uh, and you know how, if you've ever used a spirit board, you never know if the other person is actually pushing it a little bit. It did move. We didn't have anything crazy happen, 
Um, and actually, this cemetery is, is pretty calm. Um, it, you don't have that heavy, heavy feeling that you do in some other places. Um, we've experienced a few things that are weird, but again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call this a very a terribly active cemetery. But anyways, we, uh, we did that, and so many things could have gone wrong. Uh, something, we could have contacted something evil, uh, something could have attached to us, followed us home. It, it would have been horrible. Uh, so it was stupid. Uh, I know know now. And, of course, we did it at midnight. And now I know, you know, the true witching hour is, you know, around 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. So luckily we, we didn't do it then. <laughs> we could have had uh, had another result. But it was uh, it was something I, I did once and won't do again. And uh, those holes are six feet deep. Luckily, we were younger and stronger, and we could uh, we could get out of them. So that's my crazy story, and uh, I would not recommend anyone doing. It. In fact, that is probably and maybe I've used the spirit board once or twice when I was younger, but that is the absolute last time I used the spirit board. I'm a little disappointed that we did not get the responses that we'd like. I knew it was a long shot, but uh, we had to try. We did get a few things. Thank you for watching, and please stay tuned for our next adventure.